Okay, good evening, uh, friends. Uh, relatively a dull topic, you know, catheters and contrast media. See, practically many of you may be involved in a lot of work in the cath lab, and you all will have some degree of practical knowledge about catheters, some degree of practical knowledge about contrast media. So I will I will tell a few points. First, I will start off with contrast media, and then we'll go on to catheters. Basically, if, suppose if you are asked a question, uh, what is contrast media? We need to remember that in uh, pediatric cardiac clinical practice, there can be three types of contrast media. One is radiographic contrast media, what we commonly call as contrast media, which we use in the cath lab, which is some of the iodinated contrast. Then comes uh, during MR imaging, MRI contrast agents like gadolinium. Uh, then the third one is echo contrast agents, which are used in echocardiography. So, radiographic contrast agents are agents that are injected into the cardiovascular system either in heart chambers or in the blood vessels, which contain a high molecular weight halogen iodine and that has got a peculiar property of absorbing the external x-rays and prevent them from reaching the image detector. I think a couple of days ago there was a talk on how the cath lab machine functions and I think Sankita was talking. The basic principle of how a cath lab functions is in one corner x-ray will be released, the x-ray will go through the patient and whatever x-ray is going beyond the patient is going to be falling onto a image intensifier or a flat panel sensor. In the past, it used to be image intensifier. Now it is called as a flat panel sensor. I'm sure you will all be knowing what is the difference between an image intensifier and a flat panel sensor. I'll just make it brief. Image intensifier means a high energy electron comes and hits on a photovoltaic cell and that cell generates a particular amount of electricity depending on the places where this photovoltaic cells are present it generates proportional electricity in various areas and that produces that is converted into a image the present generation is called flat panel sensor which means it's basically a digital conversion so the x-rays that falls on the sensor is digitally converted into an image that you are going to be seeing. So whenever there is a high molecular weight substance, that substance is going to prevent the x-rays from crossing through. So for example, if you place a block of lead in between, no x-ray will go through. Our body consists of various agents, various tissues, which will have variable amounts of uh, x-ray absorption and depending on the amount of x-ray absorption the x-rays will reach the image intensifier or the flat panel sensor for example if it is an air filled cavity like stomach or lungs more x-rays will pass through if it is a thick structure like a bone or a tooth then less amount of x-ray will cross because most of the x-rays will be absorbed in that area itself so this is the basic principle the second group of contrast is the MRI contrast agents, which is gadolinium, which alters the magnetic properties of the adjacent hydrogen nucleus. We all know that every structure in our body, every cell, every molecule, whether it is a carbohydrate, fat, protein, anything, is containing abundance of hydrogen nuclei. And the hydrogen nucleus oscillations is altered by the contrast agent that we are going to give. The third one is echo contrast agents. Basically, in short term, it is small gaseous bubbles that produces reverberations when hit by an ultrasound. We will go into each one of them. Radiographic contrast agents are in what we use in cardiovascular system is largely iodine based. Whatever is used in the gastrointestinal tract will be barium based. I think you will be aware right from your MBBS days that barium is the basic uh, contrast agent that is used in the gastrointestinal tract. In, in uh, cardiovascular system itself, sometimes gas is also used. For example, let us assume the patient is having severe renal failure. And you are suspecting that the patient may be having a severe renal artery stenosis. What you can do is, you can hook the blood vessel renal artery 
and inject carbon dioxide. So what will happen? Carbon dioxide is an, like a gas. It's going to allow the X-rays to pass through. So it will look like as if something similar to stomach gas bubble or something similar to yeah, lungs, it will become black in color. And in that black, then you look at what is the luminal narrow. So a tight renal artery stenosis in a kidney of a patient who is having severe renal failure can be done by a carbon dioxide injection also. So now we are primarily going to concentrate on iodinated radio contrast agents. First question is, why peculiar iodine? Why not some other substance? Why of all the uh, substances, why iodine? So it will be interesting to learn about what is the chemistry of iodine. Iodine is a halogen. So halogens means all uh, your uh, chlorine, bromine, all are, all are halogens. What is a halogen? So this is the proton, neutron, all present within the nucleus. And surrounding whatever is going around are the electrons. So if you remember your 12th standard, 11th standard uh, chemistry days, this first shell is called as the K shell, then L shell, M shell, N shell, O shell. So the electrons keep on rotating around. In the first row, K shell, there will be two electrons. Second L, there will be eight. Third and fourth, there will be 18, 18. Then the fifth. And if you talk about the innermost electron here, this, this electron will have a sufficient amount of energy because it keeps on rotating. So the amount of its voltage R is called as the energy is roughly 33.2 kilo electron volts. X-rays that are penetrating also has got something equivalent to 30 to 40 kilo electron volts. So when the X-ray beam comes and hits against the iodine's innermost shell electron, which is having the same amount of energy, it just stops that electron. It just stops that X-ray. So the X-ray does not cross through an iodine and doesn't go out. So the iodine stops it. Why iodine and not some other substance is because the innermost electrons in the K shell, that is the innermost cell, there are two electrons. Those two electrons have got uh, energy that is shared by the energy of X-rays. And so entirely the X-rays will be stopped by iodine. So X-rays absorbed, X-rays are absorbed by iodine. So if you are injecting iodinated contrast in the blood vessel, and the blood vessel will not permit the X-rays to go through, so the X-rays will look brightly dark, like, you know, be black in color. The radio density, suppose some theory question is being asked, the radio density of, a, of iodine is 25 to 30 Hounsfield units per millo, milligram of iodine per ml at a tube voltage of 100 to 120 kilowatt. The iodinated contrast agents when they are injecting, they produce two types of problems. One problem is predictable problem. Yesterday, I think today morning in the exam for national board, there was a question on what are the radiation harmful effects. Radiation harmful effects are called as deterministic effects and stochastic effects. Deterministic effect means I can predict. Stochastic effect means I cannot predict. Accidentally, it might happen. Similarly, iodinated contrast reactions can be of two types. One is predictable. The second is unpredictable. The predictable is called as IPA contrast reaction. It can produce thyroid dysfunction or it can produce contrast induced nephropathy. Type B reactions are unpredictable. It's basically something called as hypersensitivity reaction. Well, there will be sudden release of histamine, all the substances, something similar to anaphylaxis, but it is not mediated by IgE. There is no involvement of IgE antibody in this process. And so this is called as anaphylactoid reaction, similar to anaphylaxis, but it is not involving the IgE. The management of this hypersensitivity reaction will be controlling the release of this histamine by giving steroids and also H1 blocker and H2 blocker. 
H1 blocker will be something like I will injections, H2 blockers will be something like ionated injections. The predictable uh, harmful effects are primarily on the thyroid and on the kidney. Because uh, it contains iodine, is going to cause some iodine related dysfunction of the thyroid. One of the common problems is hypothyroidism. It basically, it will go and suppress the T4 production. You would have read in biochemistry that there is an effect called wolf choikoff effect. When you suddenly give a large amount of iodine, it will actually suppress the T4 production. That produces hypothyroidism. Excessive iodine intake also can produce hypothyroidism, as well as iodine deficiency also can produce Sometimes it produces overproduction of thyroid, then it's called as jot based dough effect. It is variable. It is in, in, in different people, it may have different uh, sort of reactions. I uh, will come to contrast induced nephropathy a little later. Iodine based contrast agents are uh, traditionally divided into two groups one is called ionic, and second is non ionic. Basically, iodine has got a few minutes before I was telling about the chemistry. The last shell, or, or in other words, the KLMNO O shell has got seven electrons. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So it can accept one electron. So any ionic substance which is capable of giving one electron to iodine can produce an ionic bond. So now coming back to the type of bond iodine can have. Iodine can have an ionic bond. So that is called ionic iodinated contrast. There is another group of substance which is like bound to organic substance. Organic substance means anything that contains carbon, hydrogen and all. So that's a covalent bond. It's not an ionic bond. So this is covalent bond and so this is non-ionic contrast. The reason why we are interested in ionic versus non-ionic Traditionally, when we were all medical students, only ionic bonds were available, ionic compounds were available. Sodium, diatrizovate, uh, these are all the agents do, used those days. The moment you inject a small amount of contrast and do an intravenous pyelogram, some 5% of the patient will develop severe anaphylaxis, some 5% will develop severe hypotension, febrile reactions, the patient will become much more sick at the end of the procedure. So these are the properties of the ionic uh, agents. Fortunately, your whole generation are not going to see those agents at all. Nowadays, what we have is non-ionic contrasts. Non-ionic contrast means bound to organic substances and they have a covalent bond and not the ionic bond of the previous generation. Most of the side effects are due to the hyperosmolality of the contrast. I'll come to osmolality a little later. The common uh, organic, that means non-ionic contrasts that are used today in clinical practice is iohexol, iodixanol, and ioversol. If you look at the bottles, it will be written as Omnipec 350, Omnipec 370, like that. The 350 or 370 is the milligram of iodine per ml. So the more and more the milligram of iodine per ml is there, the more and more dense contrast it will be, the more and more higher viscosity and higher osmolality will be there and more opacification also will be there. The older ionic uh, agents, diatrizovate, which is called as gastrographin and hypec, this used to be the uh, main contrast agent during our MBBS days ago. This, this will have uh, osmolality something like 2400. Very high osmolality, diatrizovate. And uh, there was also another agent called iothalamate, conrain, ioxoglate, hexabrix. These are all olden contrasts. And these all have a very high osmolality of 600 to 2400. They produced very serious reactions, but fortunately now they are gone. Nowadays, what we use is non ionic contrast. If you go into the lab, you will find that Omnipec is a very, very commonly used agent, which is iohexol. Visipec is another commonly used agent, which is iodixanol. Rarely in some of the labs, there will be ultravish, that is iopromide, and ioversal is also there. Some of them are as slow in the osmolality as 290. The normal human uh, osmolality is like 300, 330. So these are called as isoosmolar. And these are called as low osmolar. 600 to 800 are called as low osmolar. 
the uh, the older agents which are having 1000 1200 2000 and all are called high asphala agents so majority of the agents currently that we use are low asphala iso asphala is very rarely used one agent called as visipec is have is is something like iso asphala it's it, its asphala is only 290 very commonly used uh, agents in clinical practice are omnipec sometimes ultravist Visipac is rarely used. Visipac is normally given for all the patients who are having renal dysfunction. Now, uh, what is the importance of knowing about this osmolar? The higher and higher osmolar the content, more and more contrast-induced nephropathy may happen because it basically will alter the medullary concentrating ability of the kidneys, and it will lead to contrast-induced nephropathy. The definition of contrast-induced nephropathy is. from the baseline serum creatinine level 25% increase a patient is having start before the catheterization 1 mg per deciliter at the completion of the procedure if the patient is having 1.25 or more than that then it is contrast induced nephropathy or an absolute increase of 0.5 mg per deciliter then it's also called as contrast induced nephropathy you start off with the patient's value of 0.9 and now you are having 1.4 so that is also called as contrast induced nephropathy sometimes if the patient is starting out with 4 4 gram 4 uh, mg per deciliter creatinine and your your value increases to 4.5 mg that is also contrast induced nephropathy even though it is not 25% increase it's highly dose dependent the more and more the dose the more and more the incidence of contrast induced nephropathy various types of agents were tried to sub prevent this contrast induced nephropathy and nothing has been shown to be very very effective only thing is hydration is important So, if you are anticipating that you are going to be injecting a large amount of contrast in a small baby, preferably admit the child the previous day, especially for example bilateral pulmonary artery stenting, branch pulmonary artery dilatation, some very complex procedure that's going to involve lots of contrast. Previous day itself, admit and keep hydrating the child fully and continue hydration for next 12 to 24 hours. Avoid all the nephrotoxic agents. If the patient is on metformin, ACE inhibitors, angiotensin blockers, stop all of them one day prior to the procedure. Volume of contrast that can be given. How much of contrast can be given? The maximum amount of contrast that can be given is five into weight of the patient in kilogram divided by the serum creatinine. Let's assume that the serum creatinine is one milligram per deciliter. For a ten kilo child, we can give fifty ml. I have written here as fifty kg. It's fifty ml. Sorry. So ten kilo, it's fifty ml. Twenty kilo, it is hundred ml. Like that, it's five per kg. But remember. It is divided by the serum creatinine. For example, if the serum creatinine in itself is one point six, then you have to reduce it accordingly. So five into ten kilo, fifty. Fifty divided by one point six, you will have only thirty ml. So you have to inject only thirty ml. But you have to remember, if you have contrast with lower levels of iodine, we can give more. So for example, instead of Omnipec three hundred and fifty, what we have is Omnipec three hundred and fifty in in India commonly. If you are able to get Omnipec 300, then you can afford to give a little bit more, because the osmolality of the agent will depend on how much milligram iodine per ml is present. So 350 is actually 350 milligram of iodine per ml of contrast. That will have 844 milliosmol per kg. But 300 means it's 300 milligram. So when we are reducing proportionately, the osmolality will also reduce, and they are a little bit more uh, less nephrotoxic. so you can afford to give a little bit more contrast some of the operators will change it by just uh, diluting this uh, omnipack for example let's assume uh, yeah yeah uh, about say 4 ml of omnipack plus 1 ml of saline and then you try to inject that is actually not a very sound technique the reason being the image quality will actually go down the amount of contrast opacification will come down so if it is possible to get the lower uh, concentration omnipex uh, then that will be much more useful we spoke about visipec being uh, one of the good agents because visipec which is uh, iodixanol is uh, is actually an isoosmolar contrast it has got a similar osmolality similar to our blood so they identified that in comparison to the black one is uh, omnipec and the uh, the gray one is uh, visipec 
the incidence of uh, contrast induced nephropathy is much 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 lower whenever you are giving visipec so if, in case if you are having a patient who is having a borderline kidney function uh, borderline kidney function means what why are we talking about it? We, are, we often think that it's only the adults who will be having renal failure why should we talk about in a child uh, any post operative child is having actually a compromised kidney function let's assume you have done a tetralogy of fallow repair today morning and today evening the child is in a low cardiac output and you you feel that there may be a branch pulmonary artery narrowing or large aortic pulmonary collapse which are causing the low cardiac output you have to do an aortogram you have to do a cath you have to do an angiogram in such a case if you give the regular contrast they will develop severe contrast induced nephropathy and they will shut down their kidneys so we need to remember that uh, pediatric cardiology people also need to be aware about this uh, contrast induced nephropathy especially in the compromised group of children let's assume that there is a patient who is having a severe coarctation of aorta with left ventricular systolic dysfunction and low renal perfusion child will completely shut down the kidney the moment you complete the coarctation angiogram and dilatation because of the contrast what is an ideal contrast agent this is like uh, for example a question will be asked what is your ideal stent and there will be some properties that you have to tell similarly ideal contrast agent it should be water soluble not water stable sorry this is spelling error water soluble heat stable so that you know at varying degrees of temperature in the cath lab cath labs are often working at 20 degree 21 degree and all. so there should not be any change in the characteristics of the contrast between the body temperature of 37 and the cath lab temperature of 20 or 21 should be inert biologically without any antigenicity, low viscosity, low or isoosmolar. Isoosmolar contrast is visipic or iodic and all. Uh, excreted through the kidney completely. It should not have any vicarious excretion. You will find sometimes a patient who has been operated, uh, who is some, it happens very often in very young uh, newborns where you do some major procedures. Uh, let's assume yeah, there is a newborn baby who is having some pulmonary atresia with the intact ventricular septum and you do a ductal stenting in the neonatal period on the first day or second day. These children don't mature their kidneys very well and their excretions will not be optimal. And when you inject a sufficient amount of contrast, the kidneys alone will not excrete. Half of the contrast will actually come through the biliary tract. And next day morning, you do an X-ray, you will find a lot of contrast in the whole of the gastrointestinal tract. Duodenum, ileum, jejunum, all will have a lot of contrast. So this is this is called as a vicarious excretions. Like excretions happen in different different areas. Ideally speaking, an ideal contrast should be excreted only through the kidney, safe and relatively less expensive. Now, so this is about the radiographic contrasts. Now, uh, I, I I want to talk a little bit about the ultrasound contrast also because. Ultrasound contrast is an emerging field. In another uh, three to five years, you will find increasing utility of this ultrasound contrast in uh, widely practiced uh, across the world. What is basically an ultrasound contrast? You would have, you will be aware about agitated saline injection. Once you agitate saline and make the saline filled with tiny tiny gas bubbles, the gas bubbles are injected into the vascular tree, the blood with the tiny gas bubbles reaches the heart, you are doing an ultrasound. The ultrasound probe emits ultrasound waves. These ultrasound waves now go and hit these bubbles. Bubbles have got a property. Two things. It oscillates. It expands, contracts, expands, contracts, expands, contracts, depending on the hitting of the ultrasound. It is this oscillation, expansion, and contraction produces a lot of backscatter echo. So from there, a lot of reflections will happen. So it, it will appear like a bright shadow on the echo particle. The basic principle is when there is a gas-filled bubble that goes in the intravascular compartment, ultrasound beam goes and hits the gas bubble. The gas bubble will expand and contract, expand and contract. So this is the principle. Now then why can't I inject an air bubble itself? Air bubbles are not stable. It expands, contracts and it will break. That's a power. You would have seen all the children playing with small soap bubbles in the beach or in the like melas and all. They will blow a small tube of a soap bubble. The bubble will become very big. They just go and touch it, it will break. 
so they are not stable so it needs to be stable also so if it needs to be stable then we need to have some mechanism so small air bubble the difference in the echogenicity increases the back scatter and reflection of the ultrasound so the basic principle of contrast induced ultrasound is the back scatter from the bubble is increased so for any bubble you need a gas inside or either it's 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 called as the gas core and then there should be a surrounding wall the surrounding wall is the shell so there should be a shell and there should be a gas core when we are agitating saline what we get is a small amount of air bubble that is surrounded by simple water water tends to collapse if suppose if you take a bottle a bottle of water shake it vigorously there will be small small bubbles produced the bubbles will break instantaneously the reason is surface tension of the water is so high that it collapses the water molecules adjacent water molecules they just become closer and closer and they break it suppose if you add a little bit of detergent uh, rain soap or something into the water it reduces the surface tension when it reduces the surface tension the two water molecules do not attract so they remain apart so the gas bubble will remain gas bubble so you need to reduce the surface tension if you are using agitated solid how can you reduce surface tension you have to add a physiological agent that will reduce the surface tension. you cannot add soap bubble and inject into the body so albumin reduces surface tension if suppose if you take coffee and uh, take uh, two cups of coffee pour it from a height lot of bubbles produce those bubbles will not break immediately why it is not breaking milk contains albumin lactalbumin lactalbumin keeps the bubble a little bit intact than water if you take water and pour that bubbles will break instantaneously whereas coffee it will remain little longer milk it will remain little longer egg you take an egg and flip it rapidly flip it a lot of froth will come that froth will remain for another 15 seconds or 30 seconds or 45 seconds why albumin will coat that air bubble reduce the surface tension and it will not it will prevent it from breaking so the principle of agitated saline is this albumin should coat in the body when the gas bubbles are going albumin coats it the blood coats it and keeps it for some time and that can be made better by taking the patient's own blood a little bit and agitating the blood or if you are using it in the icu setting adding a tiny bit of albumin into the water into the saline and then injecting it so basic principle is in order to retain the bubble for a little longer you can add albumin but these are not going to work because these bubbles will be larger and they will be broken by the time they reach the pulmonary circulation and come out of the pulmonary circulation it will not escape the pulmonary circulation and reach the left side of the heart unless there is a communication like a pulmonary av fistula or a pfo or a vsd or a pda which is shunting right left the contrast agents have got in principle a micro bubble shell and a core now we will talk about what is a shell in agitated saline injection that we are using in our regular cath regular lab echo lab it is the body's albumin that coats so the shell is body's albumin so shell here in 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 the in the contrast what shell it should be the shell should not be eaten by the body the, the shell should be eaten by the body so that the, it doesn't remain permanently in the body so it is going to be a substance either albumin galactose or lipid or polymers so one of them which will be phagocytose by the body circulate it and within 10 seconds 10, like one minute or two minutes the whole thing should be eaten up by our polymer for nuclear leukocytes and taken away so the shell will be how easily it is going to be taken up by the immune system you cannot inject a contrast and that remains for 24 hours within the body so we don't want anything we want a contrast to stay in the 
in the heart and cardiovascular system only to the destined period that we are completing the study. It should be more hydrophilic. It should be more elastic. So elastic means we told that, that whenever there is a bubble, ultrasound comes and hits it, it will expand, contract, expand, contract. It oscillates. And when it is expanding and contracting, unlike the child's play bubble that the child is blowing out from a soap water, which becomes bigger and breaks, they should not break. It should keep on doing this expansion and contraction for a few seconds till you complete the study. So it should be more elastic. It should be able to withstand the ultrasound before bursting. And it is made up of albumin, galactose, lipid, or polymers. The gas core, inner gas core. What do we have inner gas core in our agitated saline? It's simple air. Air contains nitrogen, oxygen. Whereas that will get dissolved in the body. So it needs to stay for a little longer. So what are the gases that can be given? Heavy gases like perfluorocarbons or nitrogen. These gases are less soluble. They will stay there within the circulation. And they should not leak out of the micro bubble also. They should be remaining within the shell so that this whole shell will be phagocytosed by the polymer for nuclear leukocyte and eaten away. And this whole shell plus gas core should be of one to four micron diameter. So it should be smaller than the RDC. So this is the basic principle of echo contrast. So one shell made up of albumin, galactose, lipid, or polymer, and one gas core made up of nitrogen or perfluorocarbons. So some of the agents that are commercially available is sulfur hexafluoride, which is called sonovu. Then these are all per perfluorocarbons. Perfluorocarbon, one after fluoropropane in albumin shell, which is called optison. Then can be air in lipid or galacto shell, which is called leovist. Perflexane in lipid, which is imavist. So there are various. The outer shell is made up of a lipid or a galactose. Uh, inner or albumin, the inner gas is either a perfluorocarbon or nitrogen in the air. So this is the, this is the basic principle of an echocardiographic so, so the, uh, the third contrast about which I am not talking about is the MRI contrast. We all know that it's, it's basically gadolinium. Gadolinium changes the uh, hydrogen oscillation when the gadolinium is reaching a particular target atom. Gadolinium uh, is a primarily an MRI contrast. One of the things that you have to know, MRI is basically, uh, gadolinium is actually a nephrosafe agent. So suppose let us assume that the patient is extremely sick with kidney dysfunction. We have operated on a child with the uh, tetralogy of fallow. The child goes into complete renal shutdown, is not passing urine at all. There is anuric and you are giving peritoneal dialysis and the child uh, has got a continuous low cardiac output. You are suspecting that there are large hydrocarbonyl collaterals. You need to go and do a contrast uh, angiogram. You cannot do it because the child is already anuric. The child cannot excrete any contrast that you are uh, in such a case. Gadolinium that is used by the MRI persons can be used as a contrast agent in our cath lab also. You can inject a gadolinium. It will produce a little suboptimal opacification, but that also can be done. Otherwise, gadolinium is primarily an MR contrast agent. And uh, I don't think pediatric cardiologists, we will be ourselves injecting gadolinium. And so probably just if you know that gadolinium contrast is used in MRI, that is good enough. Echo contrast, you yourself will be using in clinical practice. And I think so you should you should know about echo contrast. So coming to catheters, again, I, I feel that all of you who are practically working in the cath lab, you will know all these things. So uh, I'll just make it very superficial. Uh, the, the, the puncture needles, there are two types. One is, one is called as a direct puncture needle technique, wherein you are puncturing with the needle into the desired vessel like femoral artery or femoral vein and advancing a guide wire. Or second is using an intravenous cannula with a central stillet, make a counter puncture, take out the inner stillet and pull back the uh, cannula and then cannulate with a wire. The guide wires, I'll come to the guide wire. The color coding of the sheet, the moment you put in the uh, guide wire, uh, the next thing will be sh uh, what sheet you are going to put. 
depending on the size of the child uh, you use four or five or six so there is a color coding the color coding goes this way and if you go into the catalog you will find all these things four french means red color five french means gray color six means green seven means orange eight means blue nine means black 10 means pink and 11 means yellow all these things try to remember because uh, in the in the cat lab you suddenly will ask uh, uh, i want a seven french sheath for doing a balloon aortic valvotomy and if the person gives a green colored hubbed uh, sheath and he says that this is seven french then you will at least know that oh he's wrong uh, it, it's not correct color coding so it's important for you to remember this color coding Again, another question would be, what does this French mean? Five French, four French, and all. What does that French mean? I'll tell you one thing. For example, six French means basically two millimeters. How did we get this uh, two millimeter? So basically, it is 22 by 7 divided by the circumference. So, so a two millimeter catheter circumference is six french six millimeter that is what is called six french like a, a two millimeter catheter's circumference is what pi into two pi r or pi into d so two millimeter diameter if you take the full circumference it is roughly 6.1 or 6.2 so six millimeter so six french means two millimeter so nine french means three so three millimeter means pi into three is what 22 by 7 into 3, roughly 9. So, this is how the French comes to me. It's, it's the circumference. Now, then coming to the guide wire. So, there is a guide wire. Basically, there are two types of guide wires. The first type of guide wire is called as the Teflon cotton guide wire. So, the guide wire's principle is like this. There will be an inner stainless steel one rod and a surrounding stainless steel wire that wraps around till the tip so how does some of the guide wires move some of the guide wires just remain straight there are two two wires that will go through there is something called as a central mandrel this white color is called as a central mandrel there is another area which is called as a movable core this movable core by pulling and pushing can actually make this area become bent so the movable core will slide separately from the uh, central mandrel. In case, if suppose if in the cath lab, if you find a broken guide wire, you will find suddenly this wire will come out and it will protrude like a thin wire out. So the, the basic structure of a stainless steel guide wire is a central mandrel with a movable core and these two are surrounded by a braiding. There are, all these guide wires are not like this. There are certain guide wires that are basically made up of a straight nitinol core with a platinum tip. For example, this is a straight nitinol core with just the tip alone made up of platinum. How will you identify this guide wires? Any guide wire that you are putting in the body and you find that the tip is extremely black in color, it is, it is often a nitinol wire with a platinum tip. One of the classical examples is roadrunner road runner wire. What is the difference between a stiff wire and a normal wire? The central mandrel we were talking. This mandrel, if it is thicker and thicker, then it is a stiffer wire. Very, very, very stiff means extremely thick. Uh, the mandrel, the mandrel is very, very thick. In in such guide wires, there is no movable core till the end. There is only the move, the, the, the finer part is only here. And if this is very short, this is short floppy tip. And if this is very long, then it is long floppy tip. Most of the stiff wires will have floppy tips varying between one centimeter to six centimeter. So this portion is called as the floppy tip. And this thick mandrel portion is called as the stiffer portion. I'm coming to catheters. Catheters are all made up of either nylon or polyurethane. They have got 
either a metal wire with a polyurethane coating or a nylon wire with a polyurethane coating. Nylon has got an almost an equal uh, strength similar to metal itself. So some of them are nylon wire mesh with a polyurethane coating. So let's see. This is a Judkins right coronary catheter. The, the question sometimes will ask, what does this JR2, JR3 mean? In every coronary catheter, the last portion is the catheter that is going to be engaging into the blood vessel. So this will be entering into the right coronary artery itself. And from here to this point, this this is so this curve between the place that is going to engage and the place proximal to it is called as the primary curve. And then there will be a second curve, which is called as a secondary curve. The distance between the primary curve and the secondary curve, if it is 2 centimeters, it is JR2. If it is 3 centimeters, it is JR3. If it is 4 centimeters, it is JR4. So this is how there is only a primary curve and a secondary curve in a Judkins right coronary catheter. Whereas if it is a Judkins left coronary catheter, there are three curves. Same way, this is engaging into the coronary. The engaging part of the coronary to the second part is called as the primary curve. So the primary curve actually will be engaging into the coronary. The secondary curve is the place which is going to be anchoring against the outer wall of the aorta. So the distance between the primary curve and the secondary curve, if it is 2 centimeters, it is JL2. If it is 5 centimeters, it is JL5. 6 centimeters, it is JL6. Now what is the logic of using this distance? Let's assume that the ascending iota, normal human beings ascending iota is like 2.5 centimeters, like, an, like an, an adult like me. My iota will be about 2.5 centimeters. So we have to hit against the outer wall of the iota, in, or in other words, right wall of the iota, and engage into the left coronary. So we are coming obliquely. So a 2.5 centimeter aortic diameter. If it is obliquely I am entering, it means I, I need a 3.5 or a 4. So 3.5 or 4 will be needed for a normal adult of whose iota is 2.5. Let's assume that I am having a Marfan syndrome and my iota is 5 centimeter. I cannot engage it by landing the secondary curve on the right wall of the iota and turning it and getting the primary curve into the coronary. So I need longer. So for a four and a half centimeter iota, I will need a JR, JL6. So that is the basic principle. So now you tell me, if suppose I have a child with one centimeter iota or 10 millimeter iota, let's assume there is a yeah, six month old baby, post arterial switch operation, you are having left ventricular systolic dysfunction. You are suspecting that the left coronary button may be narrow. And you have to go and hook into the left coronary artery. The size of the iota is 10 millimeter, small iota. So what will you order for? You will ask for JL 1.5 or JL 2. If you are taking JL 3.5, you will not be able to engage at all. So you will need JL 1.5. Let's assume that it's a newborn baby, and you have to go and hook the LCA. You are you are you are planning an arterial switch operation, and but you are not able to see proper echocardiographic views and you are forced to do an angiography. In that child, if you are going to hook the LCA, you will need JL1 catheter because that iota will be only 6 millimeter or 7 millimeter. So you need a distance between the primary and secondary curve of 1 centimeter. So that is the principle of what is a primary and secondary curve. There is also a tertiary curve that is produced when the catheter is in the body where it hits against the aortic arch. So what the curve that it forms in the aortic arch is called as a tertiary curve. Ambulance uh, catheters are uh, second group of catheters which are again used for coronary hooking. Ambulance left has got numbers as AL1, AL2, AL3 like that. Basically, this is the curve of ambulance and put a dot in the center, the radius of curvature is the number. So AL2 means if I have a dot here, this radius is 2 centimeter. So an AL2 whole curve will be roughly 4 centimeters. AL4's whole curve will be 8 centimeters because the radius, the radius is the center point to this point. So that is 4 centimeters. So there is ambulance left. Ambulance left 
has got almost a straight line. So basically, the the curved portion will go and hit against the aortic root cusps, and the tip will be entering into the coronary artery. In Amplatt's right, it will have a, a reverse curve, so that it turns the other direction and goes and hooks it. Because you have to torque the Amplatt's right to get it all, all, all the right coronary catheter. You have to torque. Because when the catheter goes in along the aortic arch, all the catheter will face actually posteriorly. So you will be facing only the left coronary. And if you have to face the right coronary, you need to torque completely anteriorly. So to make the torquing easier, the ambulance right will have an extension on this body. Another catheter that is commonly used is called multipurpose catheter. A multipurpose catheter has got a 45 degree angle between the main shaft and the turned portion. If that is sharp turn, then it is multipurpose ear curve. And if it is a smooth curve, then it is multipurpose B curve. The same, it is, it, this is smoother in angle, whereas this is sharper in the angle. So this is MPA and MPB. Some of the older catheters, very old examiners, if they ask, they will be asking you questions like, what is NIH catheter? What is Goodell Lubin catheter? What is Kurnand catheter? These are all practically nowadays not at all uh, present. So, but but uh, some uh, some extremely old examiner may just ask. Uh, ba basic, all are the same like multipurpose curve. They have got a 45, 45 degree turn. If at a 45 degree turn, if the catheter has got a end hole, it is called Goodell Lubin catheter, GL catheter. If the tip is closed with multiple side holes, then it is an NIH. It's called as National Institute of Health Angiographic catheter. Kurnand catheter means same 45 degree curve, but the tip is tapered. The tip is not the straight. Like, for example, if it is a 5 French catheter, the 5 French catheter will have a uniform 5 French along the entire curve. But Kurnand catheter will start off as a 5 French and towards the tip it will go down to 3 French. So, Kurnand catheter is a tapering catheter. But this, uh, I, I don't think there is a need to remember. It's only if, if if the person who is sitting in the exam table is a very old guy, he might be asking all these questions. Pigtail catheter is a common angiographic catheter, which is used for making angiography either in the blood vessel or in the ventricles. Pigtail's catheters, because of the multiple hole, is very safe to make a large volume contrast. So one of the questions that you need to uh, remember will be, what is the amount of flow rate that we can give through a pigtail catheter? In general, the rule is, if it is a 4 French pigtail, you can give up to a maximum of 12 ml per second. If it is a 5 French pigtail, a maximum of 15 ml per second. If it is a 6 French pigtail, 18 ml per second. If you have to use a higher volume per second more than this, you can give that if it is a diluted contrast. Let's assume you are doing a rotational angiography. Rotational angiography is done by injecting a large volume of contrast within a particular cardiac chamber in a rapid time, like say for example, four seconds. So a four second rotation, you want to give the maximum amount of contrast so that best opacification will happen. And your catheter, let's assume you are you have put in a five French catheter. The five French catheter maximum contrast that it can take is only 15 ml per second. But if you want to make it a little bit more than 15, if you make a dilution of the contrast, it will be possible. So, so, so the the 12, 12 ml per second, 15 ml per second, 18 ml per second, or a 4 French, 5 French, and 6 French, remember. And also remember that if you are having, you have to give a higher, vol, higher ml per second flow rate, then you have to dilute the contrast. In the pigtails, now you'll also find something called as a marker pigtail. Marker pigtails are where there are stainless steel markers. The markers will be separated by one centimeter. So the middle of the marker to middle of the marker will be one centimeter apart. So these are useful for doing certain interventions like pulmonary artery stenting, aortic stenting, and various other procedures. Certain catheters with pre-curved, like there is a catheter called the cobra catheter, which has got a cobra uh, snakes uh, hood-like uh, curve, which is very useful for hooking. Hydropulmonary collaterals in patients who are having tetralogy of 
So you seek the blood vessel and go and hook it. The catheter that is uh, that is commonly uh, used for hooking a vertical ductus in a patient with tetralogyphalos. Tetralogyphalos, uh, tetralogyphalos pulmonary atresias ductus will be arising from the under surface of the aortic arch. All the catheters that go in the aortic arch will be facing towards the ascending aorta. So they will not turn and they will not enter into the ductus. So this RC1 and RC2 are curves that will go and hit, like enter into the ductus. The reason why, why I want you to remember this RC1 and RC2, a few years before there was a publication in I think Annals of Pediatric Cardiology, which is our PCSI's journal. And uh, somebody published about RC catheters utility in hooking a vertical ductus in a top pulmonary atresia. So let's assume he's going to sit as the examiner, he's going to as make you remember that RC catheter is a catheter for top pulmonary atresia, vertical duct hooking. Simmons catheter, this is a catheter that has got a curve shaped like this. This curve is especially useful for hooking a blood vessel which is against our stream. Let's talk about what is against our stream. You have a descending thoracic aorta which is where the catheter is going up like this. Superior mesenteric artery, how is it going? is actually coming against us. So the blood vessel will be like this. The superior mesenteric artery will come down like that. It will be difficult to go and hook a superior mesenteric artery and get a stable position. But if you are taking this curve, imagine this whole portion is in the descending thoracic aorta, and this portion now enters into the superior mesenteric artery. You will be able to enter into the blood vessel. So Simmons curve is basically meant for hooking celiac artery, superior mesenteric artery, whichever is actually going against the stream of the blood vessel. So there will be some hydropulmonary collaterals which will be coursing like that and they will be hooked. A vertical ductus also can be hooked by this. So this is a Simmons catheter. Last, we are coming to the end. Broken bro catheter, broken bro needle. It's, it's a, it's a, it, it, it used to be a, a, catheter or, or a cath lab gadget primarily used by adults and not often used by pediatric cardiologists at all till few years ago. Now, there are so many type of interventions that are possible with the broken bone. So you all should know about broken bone. In a tiny baby who is having a hypoplastic left heart syndrome where the atrial septum is rigid and like very restrictive PFO is there, if you have to do some atrial septal stenting, you have to poke that thick, rigid inter atrial septum. You need a broken blow needle. So even in a in in a very very tiny young infant, sometimes you may be able, you may be forced to use a broken blow needle. So it's very important to know what is a broken blow needle. Broken blow needle's basic principle is it has got a uniform shaft and Towards the last three centimeters, it tapers down into a thinner needle. The common adult broken bro needles are, they have a 18 gauge shaft and it tapers to a 20 gauge tip. So 18 shaft, 20 tip is the adult transeptal needle. The same thing, one gauge down, 19 shaft, 21 tip is pediatric septal puncture needle. So how to remember it? 21 needle is your green needle, no? So the, the tip of a tip of a pediatric needle will be like a green needle. The tip of an adult will be like a pink needle. And the length of a standard broken bro sheath, uh, broken bro needle will be 71 centimeter. The mullein sheath that you are using all the mullein sheets are 63 centimeter plus the dilator tip will go to 70 centimeter. So if you put a broken bro needle at the tip, the broken bro needle will go all the way through a transeptal mullein sheet, protrude one centimeter extra. So 71, 70, 63. 63 is the sheath. 70 is with the dilator. 71 is the needle. So one centimeter extra. So you take the sheath, Put the dilator, reach the area of atrial septum, point it at the level of atrial septum, and then jab the needle. You will go one centimeter beyond. And that one centimeter, you will be poking the atrial septum and entering into the nephrium. 
plenty of interventions that are done in uh, the left side of the heart are based on transeptal puncture. You, your surgeon has done the trans TAPVC surgical repair. And post surgical repair, there is a tight anastomotic obstruction. You have to go and do a balloon dilatation of the anastomotic obstruction. You have to do a transeptal puncture. A hypoplastic left heart syndrome, atrial septal stenting, you have to do. You have to do a transeptal puncture. An idiopathic pulmonary hypertension who is getting repeated syncope in a small baby, you have to do a transeptal puncture. Congenital, yeah, yeah, any any sort of yeah, 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 mitral inflow obstruction, you want to do a balloon atrial, so you want to create an atrial septal communication, you have to do. So, transeptal puncture is a very important part of various therapeutic procedures. It is also a part of various diagnostic procedures. If you have a patient who is having a tetralogy of fallow, disconnected left pulmonary artery, you don't see a left pulmonary artery at all in the regular PA injection. You have to do a PV wedge injection and you have an atrial septum that is intact. To poke, you need a transeptal. So, transeptal puncture is a very vital part of cardiac catheterization, and you need to be aware about it. So, uh, with this, I know I'll, 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 I'll stop here. So, uh, I actually did not like this topic because it was a very mundane. Uh, I, I would have preferred to have any specific topics, specific diseases, which would be, which would be far more interesting. Because these are all certain things that are vague. But I, I wanted to tell certain points, which are uh, some of the physics, chemistry principles and all uh, that are behind the contrast media. Any questions? Any questions from? <laughs> yes. The first generation, second generation, and third generation. The first generation contrast agents are basically air filled contrast agents like Album X. So, albumin surrounded by nitrogen shell. It's called as first generation. Second generations are all perfluorocarbons. And third generations are basically coated with polymers. All these contrast agents are destined to, to stay in the circulation for a little longer time so that they pass through the pulmonary circulation, they get into the left heart, they will opacify the left ventricle. So you will be able to precisely see the left ventricular endocardial border in systole and diastole and quantify the left ventricular systolic function by ejection fraction. Identify localized left ventricular aneurysms that may happen in patients like, for example, Kawasaki disease or any left ventricular localized aneurysms. And then it reaches the coronary arteries. The coronary arteries now fill the whole of the myocardium. As soon as the entire myocardium is filled by radiographic, the echo contrast media, the whole of the myocardium now looks like a white structure. There is something that is called as mechanical index of the echocardiography. Mechanical index means the power with which you are hitting the ultrasound. So you do the study with a low mechanical index. That means you are using a very low energy uh, ultrasound. So you are sending weak ultrasound impulses. These bubbles are not broken at all. So you are allowing the entire myocardium to be filled with the myocardial contrast. So the moment the whole of the myocardium is filled, the whole myocardium now becomes white. Now you give a high mechanical index, a pulse of high mechanical index. That one pulse of high mechanical index, when it goes, it just breaks all the bubbles. So the whole myocardium, which was previously white, now becomes black. So the entire myocardium is now black. You are running a continuous infusion of Livo V-Star, ISOV, or uh, sorry, Livo V-Star, Albon X. So within another one second, there is a refilling of the myocardium. And when there is a refilling of the myocardium, if the left anterior descending territory is ischemic, that will not fit. You have a Kawasaki disease patient. 
you have an led that is blocked you are injecting contrast the contrast will fill the whole myocardium whole myocardium will become black white you give a high mechanical index one pulse the pulse will break the entire myocardium so the myocardium becomes black within the next two, one or two seconds the circulating contrast will now fill every area will become white except LAD territory which is ischemic if you leave it for another five seconds ten seconds LAD will also fill that's delayed fill. it's stenotic and so it will fill through other collateral slowly so ischemia is detected by myocardial contrast echo transiently so what are the applications of myocardial contrast echo in pediatric cardiology you have done an arterial switch operation you have done a ross operation ross cone operation coronary buttons and these coronary buttons are closed you will have you will be able to pick up a kawasaki disease you will be able to pick up any condition where you have interfered with the coronary tetralogy of fellow tetralogy of fellow you have operated you had a coronary that is crossing the right ventricular outflow tract that vessel that was crossing the right ventricular right outflow tract was intramyocardial. The surgeon did not see. He made a cut in the right ventricular outflow tract and he put a patch. That coronary is now gone. You will not be able to identify. The patient will have post-operative LV dysfunction. And if you do a myocardial contrast echo, you will find that the LAD territory is ischemic. So then you can presume that probably there was an LAD which was arising from the RCA which has been cut by the surgeon. So, like that. The, the importance of identifying a coronary problem will, will be in myocardial contrast echo. There is left ventricular opacification is for left ventricular aneurysms, left ventricular thrombus, left ventricular systolic function. So these are identified. Non-compaction of left ventricular myocardium. You give the myocardial contrast, you will have, find complete non-compaction. You will be able to clearly identify a non-compaction. Amount of non-compacted myocardium, amount of healthy myocardium, everything can be differentiated. A large thrombus in the left ventricle caused by something, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome in a small baby. You are having a large left ventricular thrombus. You will be able to identify a filling defect. So, the myocardial contrast echo, left ventricular opacification, these are all agents. These are all uh, studies that are possible. You have a patient who is having a markedly dilated right ventricle. Let's say, say idiopathic pulmonary hypertension or post-operative pulmonary hypertension. The entire RV you can fill with myocard the myocardial contrast and you can assess the systolic and diastolic. The, the, when you are tra tracking a fractional area change of uh, right ventricle, highly trabeculated right ventricular myocardium. So it will be very difficult to track exactly the borders. But if you are using a myocardial contrast, if you are using a contrast agent, the right ventricular opacification will be far more better. So myocardial con the contrast agents have got a substantial clinical use. <coughs> Anything else, Raghu? Actually, Raghu wanted to tell that we have not uh, specified the three types of contrast.